Thank you, everyone. What did I do before coming to the podium? I walked, right? And walking is something everyone does all the time. So how someone walks, it gives an indicator of how that person's health is. And in this work, we look at the video recordings of subjects walking away from a camera and try to see whether they have signs of ataxia. Now my second question is, how many of you know about ataxia? Please raise your hand. All right. How many of you know about Parkinson's disease? All right. So ataxia is also a neurological disorder like Parkinson's disease, and it shares many similar features. So what happens is many times it's often confused with Parkinson's disease or other movement disorders. And sadly, ataxia affects about 0.7% of US population and it remains largely undiagnosed. So this is why we explore whether artificial intelligence can help us assess ataxia symptoms. So we collected data from 11 different clinical sites located in different states in the USA. And we'll give you a brief overview of our methodology, key results, and most importantly, the video data set we have collected, it's publicly available for everyone who are interested to like analyze and do models on it. Only the face are blurred for privacy reasons, but the uh, videos are available. So, as with video data sets, there are some challenges. First of all, the size of the data set is really small, and we are trying to assess a complicated disease like ataxia. Also, if you look at the videos, there could be many persons visible in the recording frame, but we only need to identify the patient and analyze their data. Also, there are variability across different clinical sites, and there are interpersonal differences. So we start with the clinical annotations. For ataxia assessment, SARA is a clinical scale. So a neurologist look at how someone completes a task and rate it on a scale of 0 to 8. So for this gait task, which is just walking, a zero score would mean your walking pattern is completely fine, and the eight score is mean you cannot walk, like even with other supports. So in our data set, we have 155 videos collected from 89 unique participants, and 65 of those participants had ataxia. And as you can see, like, they are collected from different clinical sites and they have different SARA score associated with it. So to start our video analysis pipeline, we analyze the raw videos frame by frame. And for each frame, we use faster RCNN algorithm, which is for object detection. We do it here for detecting persons. And to track, like, these are the frames of person one, these are the frames of person two, in the entire video, we use the sort algorithm. Now, we have, like, this type of information that these are all the frames of person one. But do we know whether person one is the patient? So let's brainstorm some ideas to detect like who is the patient and who was probably like doctor, passerby, or other persons. So one heuristic can be the one without the apron could be the patient because doctors always wear apron. Or maybe a passerby is someone who awkwardly appears and goes away quickly. 
And maybe the patient is the person who has the most movement. But the question is, how do we compute who has the most movement in the video? So we come up with a height reduction score based on the bounding box that defines the person. You can read more about it in our paper. But yeah, once we determine, like, these are the frames of the subject we are interested in, we analyze their body pose using MoveNet algorithm. And once we have their body pose, we can extract many different clinically relevant features and train our machine learning models with it. So what are those meaningful features? So we look at gait speed, like how fast someone is walking. We look at the step size of each of my step. Like, am I walking too, like, is the step size too small or too big? We also look at the step width, which is the distance between left and right foot. And we also look at balance, like whether you reach out for support or other type of things when you are walking, stands among other features. And since these features are clinically meaningful and significant, we only needed very simple classifiers like random forest to do either ataxia risk prediction or if someone has ataxia, their severity assessment. So from our risk prediction model, we do a 10-fold cross-validation to assess the overall performance of the model. And as you can see, we achieve 80% F1 score on predicting whether someone has ataxia or not. We also do a leave one clinical site out cross-validation to see like whether our model trained on maybe 10 clinical sites can perform better on an unseen clinical site. So in many sites, our performance is pretty robust, but there are some clinical sites where we have less data, more variability. Our model was not able to do so great. So there are like chances for improvement. And the results are similar for the severity prediction as well. So in general, the performance is pretty good. We have 0.73 Pearson's correlation coefficient. Uh, but again, like there is a clinical site where the model is failing to perform well. We also do a shapely analysis to see like which features our model is looking at. And we find out the most important features are also clinically meaningful. Like when you walk, if your left and right feet is like too much separated, there is some problem in the work, and the model is identifying that. And as an extension to this work, uh, we can do gait analysis at home or in hospital where we already have cameras installed. We can also translate the analysis for other kind of movement disorders, and maybe we can study the difference in signal among movement disorders like Parkinson's and ataxia. Again, please feel free to check our repository for the code and data set which is publicly available and reach out to me if you have further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, or we, we can uh, now invite uh, the, the, the authors of the seven input papers uh, to be the panel so we can have some discussion. Thank you, very good. Uh, I just summarized those papers. But then you <laughs> okay, it's uh, very exciting to, to see those excellent works. And because in traditional health assessment, well, you know, normally there are lots of, uh, uh, well, features or biomarkers and the clinicians see them. And, uh, you know, like uh, the IoT mobile vision, you provide lots of uh, new, like, uh, digital biomarkers or digital phenotyping. 
you know, to, to, to provide additional information and also can, you know, like uh, let uh, monitor our health in a continuous and objective manner. Uh, but apparently is uh, from the digital device, how to what extent we can get the useful information. Yeah, so, you know, like uh, AI signal processing play a big role. And, uh, and if we get useful information, uh, to what extent we can trust that? You know, then AI problem, overfitting generalization, become, uh, you know, like become a health assessment issue as well, because we use the AI approaches. So, um, do you have any, like, uh, thoughts? I know for the auto gate, auto gate, you use clinician to extract the fe features, so it's kind of a help tool. That's why you just use the simple models. But, I mean, I mean for lots of, works, you use like a deep neural network, you know, did you talk with the clinician, how, to what extent they could trust it? Yep, do you want to start? Uh, yes, so I think uh, we as a computer scientist sometimes think about the methodological details too much and think less about the applicability. Uh, in my PhD work, I felt like uh, often if you use complex deep learning models, it may give you like one, two percent improvement in accuracy. 